I, for those of you who don't know me, I can't believe there's anyone here who doesn't know me. I'm the longtime curator at the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center and a longtime Rotarian. Um, I came here as a sweet young thing of 33 and I have had my 65th birthday now. So um, known quantity, but what I do in town changes and it changes three times a year um, at the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center. And it often involves collaborating with other curators who come in and do a program for us, certainly with our own education curator, and very often with other institutions up in the town. We, we have had alliances um, with a, a variety of institutions over the years, including hospice and um, the turning point and the retreat. Um, and I, I could go on and on and on and on because when, when you're using art in the context of a community, um, the content of that art might uh, spur you to create um, cross-community alliances and, and fruitful collaborations as ways of amplifying themes that are in, in the work. So by way of introducing my guest, Rick Holschutz, I'm going to sort of eat around how I met him so that you will see why I came to him. <laughs> so I, I first was made aware of Rich when a project that the museum was, it was not a production of the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center, but it was a collaboration with the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center with the To the River project um, that did a massive cleanup on the park and the bank of the river that the museum overlooks on the Connecticut River. So the project went from the bridge all the way down behind the old railroad parcel station, we believe. It's, I, we don't think it's the real station. We think it was a parcel outbuilding and then down to the point behind that uh, parking lot area. And there was a massive cleanup and then there was an installation of a mural about, about the river. Photographs that had been manipulated, colorized and put, set on the side of the building in a rhythm pattern. And there was an opening ceremony for that. And, and because the land on the Connecticut River with New Hamp with, with the with, with Mount Potastaquit looming above us is the traditional lands of the Abenaki. Um, our collaborators, these three artists, had invited Rich um, to come and be a part of the opening ceremony along with a, a host of other people. And Rich stood up and introduced himself. And at that time he said, I'm still a student of my native language, the heritage language of, of the Abenaki. And he, he read a poem first in, in, in the language of the Abenaki, and then he translated it for us. And I was monstrously impressed. It was a beautiful um, reclaiming of language, reclaiming of place, um, and just a heartfelt connection to ancestry. And so I thought, that's great. He's wonderful. And I introduced myself to him that day and I toddled off around my business. And then earlier this year, we did a show with the Brattleboro Words Project, which was their show. And we were showing the beautiful map that has been created about these 30 or 40 stories um, that take place from Guilford on up to Grafton in our county and along the banks of these two rivers um, that were the, the traditional hunting grounds and living seasonal living grounds for richest people. Um, and, and he came to that party in that opening and we struck up another conversation. Um, and that's when I first learned about the Atui project. Um, we've had Buzz Schmidt, Schmidt here to talk to us about the, um, the, the Retreat Farms project. And on that project is um, the um, Atui project. Um, and and the, the um, director of that project is Rich once again. And, and that the word means together in space and time. And it's a community initiative uh, to affirm native relationships to the land and its inhabitants, um, to raise indigenous voices and to foster inclusion and understanding in place, which brings me to how we are collaborating. And then I'm, he's taking the rest of the program. <laughs> So as part of the exhibition program, we have a sculpture garden at the south end of our building, right by what was the Holstein building, later Marlboro College building. 
Um, and we cleared out that entire bank, we've planted it, we have seats there, and then we can put sculpture in there. But when you're in that area, you are overlooking the bank of the river. You are looking up to Mount Rotastiquet. You see the flow of the river. You also see fundamentally railroad tracks, the backside of a town, and um, the industrial history of Western culture. And what I chose this year was a, a piece by Scott Boyd of, of further up north. And it's an obelisk. And it's, the obelisk is entitled Endangered Alphabets. These are alphabets from around the world, languages from around the world that are endangered of going extinct. Um, and Rich and his colleagues have saved their language and pulled it forward. Some of these might have that kind of um, potential. Some of them will go extinct. And I'm citing that on that land in that sculpture park where you overlook the place where a language almost went extinct and a place that Rich and his project are trying to bring into the fullness and awareness of our entire community. And I thought it was a perfect place for a collaboration where he interprets the land and I interpret a, a work of art in that land that brings language together. And from that, you can all go on speak review <laughs> and Rich is gonna take the program. Thank you, Rich. Um, Peter. Pita Ulioni Mala, Kwai Uski Nidombak, and Delewizi Litz, and the Iwantastika Kutsi So Kwakik, Pakwinong Guzian, and we go down Namiolan Pamgiskak. My name is Rich, as Mara has mentioned to you many times. Uh, thank you so much, Mara. It's good to see you all here. Happy to see you. Happy to be with you. I see many familiar faces. Um, Others, which are not, but I see more familiar names, which means your reputations have preceded you. <laughs> Usually that's a good thing, <laughs> but we're all here in this community together. And that is the point of this project, this new project um, that is being launched in collaboration with the retreat farm called Atui. As Mara pointed out, this isn't a Beneke word, Atui, A-T-O-W-I, and it means together in space and time, and it describes what we're doing right now. So we're all different people. A lot of different people have passed through this area, which we call Brattleboro today. Some of those people we remember, some of them we remember well, we memorialize them. Others we may not even be aware of. Um, all of those people and all of those stories are still here. And that's the really interesting thing to me is all these layers of being that exist concurrently and inform who we are and make us up. We walk on the graves of thousands and thousands of people who have been here every day. And those people are within us now. Very simply, science, science. Um, Space, uh, time, uh, matter and, excuse me, matter and energy are conserved. There's nothing new on this planet. And so all of our food and our water and everything that has come out of this place is now making us up. We carry these stories forward. So it's good to learn them so you know who you are. You don't know where, you, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've come from. All right, the lessons of history, we all know about these these things that get repeated, but we, we need to internalize them and make them real. And how do we make them real? We make them real right here um, in ourselves, in the places that we live. Place is everything as far as I'm concerned. If you do not understand how you are in relationship with the place that you live, how can you conduct yourself in any other business, any other place with other people? It needs to start right here. Charity begins at home, the old Puritan aphorism, but it's true. It starts inside and it radiates out. So I'm a preacher's kid, could you tell? <laughs> um, I, I like to think that I'm in recovery now. <laughs> could you tell? <laughs> 
Um, I'll leave it at that. We won't get into uh, in, into divisiveness because I'm here to talk about being reconnected. And I'm here to talk a little bit about the stories of this place. So as Mara um, elucidated, there's this new uh, sculpture uh, obelisk being set up next to the museum in full view of one Tosticate, the mountain, which is behind me here. Um, one Tosticate at sunset in the late winter. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, I like to think that it defines us here in Brattleboro. Uh, when, when we're here, we are in the presence of this mountain. And it helps us to uh, understand what this place is and how it feels to be here. It's across the river in New Hampshire. So we, um, we will let them pay for it and we'll take all the benefit. And uh, let's talk a little bit about words because I am a student of the language. Um, I'm, I'm, I like to think that maybe I made it out of kindergarten now. I'm, I'm just learning. But within the language, as my elder Ely Joubert has said, within the language are the secrets of the culture. And we don't often think about it, but our language um, uh, epitomizes our culture and the place that we come from. There are things said in other languages that cannot be said in English. It's a different way to see the world. And so this comes out in the words. Uh, the mountain that's in the background behind me and which is in front of the museum view is one tosticate. This is a word that has survived in almost its original form to this day and for which I am grateful because most of these words are now hidden. But this mountain, one tosticate, comes from the name, the traditional name of this place where we live. We call it Brattleboro today. It is traditionally known as one tostagak. You can see the similarity, one tostagak, one tostaket. This is a word that refers to the West River, the one tostuk, that's the traditional name, one tostuk, meets the Quenetuk, the Connecticut River. You can see the similarity there as well. Quenetuk, Quenetagak, Connecticut, that's the river right in front of us. And here sits this mountain where the West River meets the Long River, which is its typical translation. What does that mean? There's a story. You might not have heard of it. I don't know that whole story. I'm still learning it. But inside the language, we can get some clues. Wantastuk is the West River. Quenetuk is the Connecticut River. You see that they share the suffix tuk. Tuk means river, literally, but more, more uh, authentically, it means water that is in dynamic motion. It can refer to a wave, it can refer to the tides, and it can refer to a big river, a tuk. Small rivers might be called a sibu, such as the whetstone. That would be a sibu. The big rivers are tuks, they are water in dynamic motion. This river in front of Brattleboro right now is no longer a Took. The Vernon Dam was built in 1909. It's a series of lakes and impoundments now. It is no longer a Took, but it has always been a Took in the past. It wants to be a Took, and there's another story and something to think about. Quenetuk means long river. Wantastuk means the river where something is lost. That's what one toss means, something that is lost. Is there a story there? You betcha there's a story there. I'm not even going to get into it right now because it's a long, long story. It's 12,000 years. Maybe this will come out in the museum ex exhibition. I'm plugging for you, Mara. All right. <laughs> come hear some stories. I only yeah, have so much. That's our joint decision, by the way, is how are we going to manage to to link the stories in a way in an outside exhibition that that is a, is one sculpture and and what kind of interface are we going to need and 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 how are we going to get them to go down 
to the retreat farms to where you've started embedding stories, uh, I believe, or what programming might we do where you become our storyteller? Because uh, I love stories. <laughs> <laughs> right, everything is a story. It's all a story. Stories are the things that we, we, we share with each other and we each have our own story. Everyone is different, every single one. In my world, there is no objectivity. There is no one truth. It's all true because you see the world through different eyes and through your own experience. So I'm gonna accept that. And I'm gonna offer some stories to you that you may not have heard before. And I'd like you to accept those because they're just as real. Metaphor is actual. Not everything that, that is, is uh, valid is visible. There are a lot of things that you can't see. We are human beings. We create value systems. We create religions. We create uh, different ways to explain what we can't explain. And those are real, very real. You can call it a matter of faith. You can call it a matter of belief. It's being a human, being human. And, and, and uh, I just think it's all awesome. <laughs> it's, it's such a, a rich um, pile of gifts that we're given. And I'm grateful for that. Um, so here's the thing. We have the word uh, Connecticut still here. Quinnituk. We have the word Wontastagak still here in the mountain. We have this town called Brattleboro. Why does nobody know that this is called Wontastagak? Why does nobody know that? Why is it called Brattleboro? Does anybody know that? Yeah, Mara knows a little bit about that. Um, Mr. William Brattle has his name attached to this place. Mr. William Brattle never lived here. He actually has no attachment to this place other than monetary. This starts to explain the difference between stories. Mr. Brattle is considered important because he invested heavily in land here. Some of it he inherited from his father, William Brattle the Elder. Some of it he bought, but he never lived here. But his name is attached to this place. However, the people who have always lived here, the Abenaki people, that call it one Tostagok, and who are still here, Asqua and Oldi Bana, Yodali, we are still here. Their name is no longer attached to this place. It did not involve money. There's a story, something to think about. Okay, now we're running down our time, Rich. So I just <laughs> wanted to. <laughs> because the stories are fantastic and, and Rich and I will now be working for the next several months trying to figure out which stories and how to bring them to life. And I think you can see by his performative qualities as the son of a preacher man, <laughs> that, that this is gonna be um, a wonderful, rich, deep dive into the um, long, um, detailed, wonderful history of this place. Um, now, uh, it's 1246. Does that mean we have four minutes or have I gone over? I think as of right now, you're all set. We should wrap up before one and we would love to leave some time for questions. Okay, great. But I think we started a little early. So as of right now, you're all good. Oh, okay. Thank you. So then I'm going to open it up for questions. I see that Sherry Ann Broadhurst has her hand up. A very, very basic question because which has always perturbed me in terms of names I, I just like names to be said properly so the question is why do some people say Abenaki and other people say Abenaki which is the proper name that is a great question Sherry Ann um, you delivered one of my children <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, that is a that is a good question, and it comes up often. Um, and I think I provoke it sometimes because of the way I jump around and the way I pronounce the word. So these are all 
different forms of the same word. None of them are right. None of them are wrong. They depend where you're coming from. And I'll give you a little, uh, just a quick rundown on that. The original word from which they all come is Wombanaki. Wombanaki. It means dawn land. It's where we are. We are in the northeast corner of this continent, and this is the place where the sun strikes first when it rises. So we are in Wombanaki, the dawn land. If you are a French speaker and, and allied traditionally with the people of this area, you're going to say a Beniki. It's a, it's a French inflection that's very close to the original word. If you're an English speaker, you might say Abenaki. It's a little more of an, a British English pronunciation. If you are from Vermont and you have Vermont characteristics to your speech, you're going to say Abenaki. Yeah. You're gonna flatten your A's out. And some Vermonters, including many native folks whom I know, they live here, they've been here a long time. They have totally internalized this. They say Abernaki and they put an R in there and it's okay. They're all the same thing. I try to say Abenaki, you say it however you want, but I'm gonna ask that you say it and admit. Excellent. Um... So you, that brings me to an interesting point because I was raised on Cape Cod with, um, there, there were two, there was the Mashpee Wabanogs and then there, there were on Cape Wabanogs and, and there are the Island Wabanogs. And I just noticed that the WAU sound, are they also people of the Don, down on Cape Cod? Just the, they're, they're, the traditional name was pronounced when I was a child, the Wabanogs, and now it's many people are pronouncing Wabanoag, but, is it the same root? That is an excellent, excellent linguistic detective work, Mara. It is the same word in a different dialect. Yes. I'm scanning. Do we have other questions? <clears throat> Alexander, you might see things I don't. I think some people have signed off, so maybe I am seeing everyone. Any, uh, anyone else got a question for Chris Mays? Hey, um, good to hear you, Rich. Um, I was wondering if you could just give a little breakdown of, of what you guys are up to right now at the retreat farm, if there's any like projects that are coming up, you know, relatively soon. Certainly, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, so Atui is a relatively new organization. It's a cultural <laughs> education outreach organization, which will be bringing forth indigenous stories of place here. Retreat Farm is our partner. They provide the institutional support, the grounds, the facilities, the, uh, the tax write-offs for donations. We take donations. <laughs> Go to our website, atawi.org, and you can donate there if you care to. Um, and we appreciate that. Um, so Atawi is going to be working with Retreat Farm as a, as a, a physical location at the Meadows, which were meadows at one time until the aforementioned Vernon Dam was built. And why there? Because the retreat farm sits at ground zero for a Beneke presence in this town. The very, very first settler in Prattleboro was Benjamin Moore and his father Fairbanks who walked out of Fort Dummer, built in the south end of the town. They were soldiers there. They walked out of that fort and the first place they went to, because you always go to the best places first, right? Dibs, you claim dibs, I'll take that. Where did they go? They went to Retreat Farm. That's where they built their log cabin. Why? It was already cleared. There was already water there. It had a sheltering hill to the back. There were planting fields right in front. Best place in Brattleboro, Retreat Farm. That's where Atui is. And we're gonna be bringing these stories forth. One of the big projects we're gonna start with is a trail around the meadows. There's already a trail there, but it's in poor condition and not very accessible. We are going to reinvigorate that trail and tell the story through a Beneke eyes. We're gonna take you to another world that's still here, but you might not know about it.
Car Carl, did you have a question? A question and a point, uh, Rich. If you're uh, if you're recovering a trail out there, and Rotarians are always looking for projects to be involved in, so uh, just keep us in mind. The other question is uh, maybe not to answer here, other than if it's going to be covered in your stories. But I'm always curious. There's a a large uh, publication called the Wyndham Gazette out on uh, Google Books. And it's got a history of the area uh, of many types, including a diary of uh, a trek that went from Ratterboro up to Champlain. And it took, uh, from Fort Dummer, it took a day, I think, to get from uh, Fort Dummer up to the, where the marina is. And they talked about a, a Native American party sort of thing going on across the river where the marina is now. But I mean, it's a good story, but it, it always made me curious of is uh, how the natives kind of used the land. Did they migrate uh, from to the river in the spring when the salmon were running? And those kind of stories about whether they kind of were planted here and used the land or did they migrate in the winter? Those kind of stories going to be uh, part of your plan? Yes, Carl. Um... We will, we will take these little snippets of historical information that we have from this place, and we're going to uh, demythologize them and put them into a cultural context and explain how this all works. So that, um, for, for example, you bring up the fact that, that native folks in this area are also stylized as being nomadic. They're not nomadic they centered themselves in particular places and they followed subsistence cycles depending on where the source of the food was, but they would always go back to the same place. That's not nomadism. It's a hunter gatherer, agriculturalist uh, form of living that is paying attention to where you are and you know exactly what you're doing at any given time. There is no wandering involved. Betsy. Hang on. You're on. You just turned yourself off again. I'm on. Um, Rich, how are you funding all these projects? Where's your funding coming from? Um, we are constantly looking for that similar to many nonprofits. Um, we do have some um, initial seed granting coming from Vermont Community Fund to get us started. Um, and part of my job is to make sure that that keeps coming. And one of the ways I do that is by talking to folks such as you guys. Um, we're all in this together and I'm here for you. And I appreciate that when it's a reciprocal. Good, thank you. Okay. Do I see anyone else with a question? Okay, we're coming down to just a couple of minutes left. Um, you know, I have to say from the first moment I heard him reading by the river, um, I was intrigued by Rich. Just, he just stood out as, as something um, unique and special and deep. Um, and then subsequent meetings, and then finally reaching out to him um, during this pandemic uh, on email, uh, and finally meeting down at the museum last week. And then he sent me um, a series of writings that he's done so that I could understand his ideas about place. And, and then today, every time I interact with him, I come away energized. <laughs> You know, so I'm thrilled to be working with you. You will all be invited to whatever the heck we cook up because we're just starting this collaboration. But I think this was a great first shot at it. So thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone.